This is a conversation with Vitas Busayanas. He's a friend living in Kiev who we met a couple of years ago at a conference there. And I'm speaking to him because I wanted to give someone inside Ukraine a chance to have their voice heard. At the moment, we are living in such a strange time. Yeah, every day people are just outside the window. People are walking in the streets, living their normal lives. But we all live at this, you know, sense of sense of something. Something terrible is upcoming. You know, something uh, uh, unpredictable. So the sense of danger, the sense of anxiety, is really high here. Vitas is a developmental coach who's interested in a lot of the same topics we cover on Rebel Wisdom, like how to understand culture and society through the lens of development and values. Uh, what Putin is doing is really challenging the whole project. He wants to show to his, again, to his inner audience that this is a failed project and the only feasible and, 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 and vital system is that which we created here, meaning uh, with the Tsar on top and all his elite taking control and people being obedient and enjoying what they what they get from the top. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the point. And then to the next level, I think he has some, I, I resist calling it spiritual ambitions, but, but probably these are religious ambitions because part of the... Uh, narrative that is being created is Moscow becoming the third Rome, as you know, the successor of Byzantine Empire and, and the savior uh, of all those traditional Orthodox or even traditional Christian uh, values, which, uh, which of course have been abandoned uh, in Europe, in the Western countries, which are filthy and rotten and so on. So uh, that's, that's partly funny, partly surrealistic, you know, because the ex-KGB officer is becoming a, a you know, global spiritual leader in his uh, ill fantasies. Um, unfortunately, that's the, that's the reality we live in. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. Vitas, welcome. Hello, Derek. So we're talking because we met at the Emerge gathering in Kiev a couple of years ago, and you were you were a fan of Rebel Wisdom. Uh, you took us around Kiev. You were very hospitable. You showed us uh, some of the the sites of like the Maidan Revolution of 2014. You were very dialed into the recent history of Ukraine, and so. I'm really keen to speak to you as someone on the ground who shares maybe some of the same developmental framework, some of the kind of ways of thinking and frameworks that we have put out on the channel to find out what's going on from many different levels. We've already spoken quite a bit offline. And in this conversation, we're going to cover the sort of different value systems, maybe the kind of religious dimension of a lot of what's going on as well. And there's so many big questions that this whole conflict, potential conflict with Russia brings up about kind of the future of the liberal project, all of these like big topics. Um, but maybe let's start with, um, maybe if you could just introduce yourself and just give a little background of who you are and what your interests are. Of course, David. Thank you. Thank you. And that uh, meeting uh, a couple of years ago in Kiev was a pure pleasure. And uh, I, I generally admire what you guys do at uh, Rebel Wisdom. So, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I live in Kiev for the last seven years and um, I'm married to a Ukrainian. So I'm, my family is, has uh, roots uh, here. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, I'm uh, now a coach, an integral master coach, actually, and um, and I work with the uh, local IT companies and help them build their leadership development systems. So basically, I'm a leadership development consultant. And previously, I was a banker working in many uh, in many different banks, but nobody's perfect. Yeah, I mean, this feels to me like a really important piece, a really important conversation. What I want to give people is a sense of what's going on the ground in going on in the ground in Ukraine. I'm a as a foreign producer for many years, I've always been quite frustrated. Like it's very understandable why the focus in the West is on 
whether we might be going to war with Russia, whether this might be a conflict that kind of goes beyond just Russia, Ukraine. I mean, that's very understandable why we'd be focused on that. But I also feel it 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 feels very narrow and quite kind of almost narcissistic to always frame it in terms of what it means for the West or what it means for us, rather than really understanding what's going on for the people of Ukraine, the people of Russia and the people in that area. And that's really what I'd like to get across in this conversation, while also touching on some of the bigger topics that it brings up, which obviously affect everybody. Um, so yeah, you, you touched on what the mood is like there. What Maybe start by saying, telling a little bit of the, the recent history of Ukraine and what the mood is now and where you think the, the, the situation is at. Yeah, so I'd like to start uh, from uh, with uh, reflecting on what you just said. And actually, we really want more of that Western narcissism, what you call narcissism, actually, too. We really want you to think more about it in the way that it's all about you, because this way we we get more attention and more support naturally. Uh, so starting from our um, recent history. So Ukraine, as you know, is a relatively young democracy. And I, I, I really proudly say that democracy. This is with all different problems, with all different uh, uh, imbalances of a young, a young state, uh, Ukraine is still a functioning de uh, democracy with all kinds of freedoms, with the, all basic freedoms of human rights, of, of, of creativity, of freedom of speech. And in many other ways, this is a free country where you can live, you can realize yourself, you can create, and that's why I enjoy this country. And the, the country is going through its struggles, through its uh, shadow work, um, facing all different inner confusions and contradictions. But anyway, it's a, a modernizing country which is striving to this Western, you know, democratic, liberal uh, set of values. Uh, it gained independence and basically it became a, a, a state in 1991. And uh, of course, since that time, uh, since that time, there were different developments. The country went through two, two revolutions in 2004 and 2014. And the second one, which we call the Revolution of Dignity, uh, meant a lot and still means a lot. That was a huge paradigm shift for the whole society. Uh, and the, 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 the society consciously chose this Western uh, vector of uh, development. Um, and um, it, 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 it um, influenced the whole agenda which, uh, which we're living in. I think what is happening now with Russia, the whole tension is uh, to a large extent the, 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 the byproduct of that revolution which um, the Ukrainian society won. And of course, after right after that revolution, we had Crimea, we had the start of war in Donbass. So, so when we speak about the war, it's, uh, it's relative in a sense, because Ukraine is at war for the last eight years, since uh, early 2014, unfortunately. And it already required more than 14,000 lives only on the Ukrainian side. So you can imagine that this, uh, this is an ongoing uh, war, which uh, the country got used to, in a sense. And what is happening on the ground? Uh, it's, I would say it's mixed. Uh, there are positive, positive sides and there are natural negative sides, of course, starting from the negative ones, of course, there's, there's a lot of anxiety everywhere. Uh, people people feel more anxious, people feel more reactive, and you can feel that on the streets, even in the traffic. Uh, people are trying to, um, to think about different scenarios, A, B, a, B C, and, and so on. Uh, or many of my friends are speaking about this, you know, emergency suitcase, what you have to buy and collect in order to, uh, to be able to react quickly if the war starts and evacuate uh, and of course uh, of course people also realize that you can never really be prepared for these kind of scenarios uh, this is always 
always relative to some extent. At the same time, I don't, from my circle of friends uh, or people I, I work with, I don't know anyone who has left the country because of this danger. Literally no one. And, um, and that's a good sign, I think. Uh, people are consciously staying, staying here, facing that risk. Uh, the same as me and my family, we every few days, literally we have discussion with my wife, uh, should we stay or should we leave? Uh, and uh, and every time, very consciously, we we, we choose to, to to take this risk. And you know, funny <laughs> funny enough, or I don't know, maybe sad enough. Uh, one of the reasons is that we don't want to create that that pleasure for Putin and all his Russian <laughs> machine, because what they exactly uh, what they exactly want is us to panic, to flee the country, uh, to start um, to stop doing what we are doing, uh, you know, to drop everything, to 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 basically stop living our our normal life, uh, and by continuing with it, we are demonstrating. No, we believe in this country. We want to protect it. We. We, we, we demonstrate, demonstrate it by staying here. Uh, so I don't want it to sound heroic, but this is a pretty conscious uh, choice. Are there any misconceptions that you think that the, the West has about what's going on at the moment? Yes, I think so. Uh, there are many misconceptions and knowing how good this uh, Russian official you know, propaganda machine uh, of course uh, of course we need to do some you know, myth busting and uh, there are different myths and misconceptions about both Ukraine and this whole tensions tension with NATO so let's start from the latter like uh, uh, that recent enemy at the gates narrative you know, the, the the key message for the russian internal audience is that look they've been building up military power at our borders and uh, all those nato countries all our ex-soviet and ex-socialist bloc countries became uh, became nato of course there is no enemy at the gate and we all understand that no no one from uh, nato countries was uh, trying to uh, threaten Russia in any way. And of course, Ukraine is uh, neither uh, uh, a threat in any in any way. Of course, the Ukrainian army is much stronger now, thank, uh, thanks to Putin, actually, thanks to the aggression in the east of Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine was uh, forced to build up the army or to basically to build up a new starting from 2014. But uh, generally, there is no threat. So this is the, the myth number one. Uh, another one is that, you know, there are, uh, there are lots of myths about uh, Ukraine itself. And um, uh, one of the most uh, uh, disappointing uh, to Ukrainians is that uh, many people in the west they treat russia and ukraine as one nation as one ethnic group which is which is not truth of course there are two different nations uh, uh, in many ways uh, some some aspects like um, historical background some some cultural aspects are overlapping but generally these are two different nations with two distinct languages uh, two distinct cultures and most importantly i would say two distinct value systems uh, especially when it comes to uh, to the value of freedom, generally this big existential value of freedom. You know, the general approach here and in Russia uh, uh, is very, very different. For example, here people cherish and, <laughs> and appreciate freedom in many ways. Uh, and of course, because the society is still relatively mature, we take freedom uh, aside from uh, responsibility, it's not necessarily going together, but still freedom is something big and people are, are ready to protect it. At the same time, uh, 
in Russia, I don't want to generalize, but but usually if we take the the, the major attitude, yeah, the the dominant attitude, so freedom is something something bad, something wrong, something uh, something wrong, something even toxic. I spent uh, six and a half years. Uh, living and working in Russia in four different cities actually throughout the last 18 years of my life, which is a good third, you know. And um, uh, I know quite uh, many people there. I still have friends. I am community, communicating with some of them. And sometimes we really go into that philosophical discussion about some uh, values as freedom. And I, I even hear from from people of my or even younger generation that you know that's uh, that's not good you you have to have a strong tsar with a with an iron fist above your head otherwise we uh, we get uh, messy so uh, that that notion i would say is the key distinctive fa distinction uh, factor between the ukrainians and the russians and how do you think that kind of developmental thinking can illustrate this? I mean, we're probably talking here about spiral dynamics, the idea that there are sort of different value systems at work. Uh, of course, of course, I think so. And, and uh, it, it helps to put things into perspective in some ways. I think the most sensitive thing is that uh, the Western democracies, let's put them in, just let's pack them in, in, one, in one group, I mean, the, the US, of course, the UK and the Western European countries, uh, those are looking at, the, at things from that postmodern green pluralistic uh, perspectives, which can be also characterized as you know, proposed truth. All, there is no one truth. All perspectives need to be taken into account. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and all perspectives needs to be sympathized with, you know, so, so you need to not only take into account, but also sympathize uh, all those views. And that's, I think, a problem because uh, Putin is manipulating and overusing all that approach. Uh, and at the same time, he's, uh, he's mocking uh, the, whole, uh, the whole Western approach in many ways. He's uh, making lots of jokes, there are a lot of memes going in 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 in, in russian media and social networks about this you know the most popular one is probably calling europe which is europa in in russian they're calling gay um, emphasizing the gay uh factor which doesn't need to be <laughs> doesn't need to be elaborated you know so um uh, so i think that uh, uh, Western countries should be more rational uh, in a in a in a sense and more selective in uh, and more resilient to that propaganda and uh, more critical in a way uh, in uh, in sympathizing with the Russian view because uh, all the uh, dominant narratives they are they are just artificially created. Uh, I've heard such uh, views from some uh, German thinkers that we are, to a large extent, we, we are responsible for what Putin is doing now because we didn't show enough respect. Uh, we didn't show enough, uh, we didn't give them uh, enough sense of dignity in the 90s and in 2000s, which I think is a is a total rubbish again because uh, i think the western countries were showing lots of respect i lived in in russia during that uh, period of time and um, uh, western countries were investing a lot uh, they were creating different uh, uh, different joint ventures uh, different uh, projects uh, in in all areas so i think that claim is is wrong so what is what, what developmental levels I see playing out in, uh, in Russia is very unhealthy, cynical orange, meaning that this is a kleptocratic regime, which is all about money and wealth and, and power with very dominant threat, very dominant uh, 
what would what Ken Wilber would call a red shadow or red uh, addiction, because whenever you need to solve any any problem, you really uh, take out your guns. So this whole uh, military activity is is the expression of red, and the manipulation uh, and the well designed propaganda is coming from that unhealthy orange, which uh, the postmodern green is not really able to deal with it's not really able to respond with uh yeah so what i think the response should be uh, in the ideal world of course i'm not sure that is uh, feasible in the near future but uh, in the ideal form, uh, world the western response should be uh post-conventional it should be coming from the second tier from the integral perspective which is which is teal in Wilberian colors or yellow in spiral dynamics, which should take all those levels into account, uh, which would of course show lots of respect to human rights and to uh, to uh, put put efforts into connecting uh, uh, to the Russian side, um, not only on the rational level, but of the, on the level of heart, but at the same time, it would keep the, uh, the rational orange view, the critical thinking, uh, the ability to, to evaluate the whole, uh, the whole um, story behind, you know? And of course, with strong blue or amber, or with strong legal and formal uh side and of course with the strong red being able to respond even in uh, in the military ways unfortunately we don't see that kind of um uh, that kind of uh, leadership at the moment and um, especially after what happened in afghanistan you know that whole um, whole idea of uh, military resistance is not at the table nearly uh, even even that's um, uh, under discussion. Yeah. yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the clashing kind of worldviews here. So a lot of people have taught, you mentioned Afghanistan. Afghanistan is probably a really good example of um, a, a hugely significant moment in terms of the liberal project, the sort of naive liberal project that kind of believed that it could export democracy and didn't didn't kind of recognize that tribal that the tribal kind of system in Afghanistan was much more deeply rooted and kind of a, a recognition I think that you can't simply kind of export democracy on the barrel the barrel of a gun or uh, even with a peacekeeping force. But the, the the sort of the deeper question of like the conflicting value systems here of whether the liberal project is itself under threat, which is obvious, obviously is, but Putin has a very different worldview. He sort of sees himself in a very different way and sees Russia in a very different way, under influence from people like Alexander Dugin. And there's a kind of, this is where the religious dimension maybe comes in. Um, maybe you could kind of frame that conversation first, and then I want to kind of pick up on a couple of those points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting angle. So I went, I just, would like to start from uh, mentioning some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the goals which we think that Putin has in in this whole uh, situation, and this is not not linear, of course. Um, he's after something completely different. So uh, locally here in Ukraine, of course, he is uh, he's willing to restore the Russian Empire or the. Uh, the USSR, whatever it would mean for him, it seems that it, these two th things are pretty pretty close. Uh, and um, and of course, uh, Ukraine is a crown jewel in a sense in many ways. Without that, Russia is not uh, is not an empire. It's there's a there's a saying or a term in Russian. Uh, uh, Nieto Imperi, which is which is which can be translated as not quite an empire, you know. So of course, without without Ukraine, Russia is not complete an empire, and that's uh, that's uh, extremely important to Putin. I think he wants to stay in history as the collector of of those 
Russian lens as he sees it. Uh, and of course, he cannot already take Ukraine over in a sense, because uh, Ukraine is a completely lost territory. He can only take it by force, you know, only by, by brutal, violent force. Uh, and uh, uh, another goal, I think, or next level goal for him is to make Ukraine a failed state. Uh, because if uh, uh, for them, for, for him, this is critically uh, uh, important or even vital, because if the Russians see that their friends and relatives in Ukraine, they're living uh, they're living better in uh, in a wealthier uh, society with all human rights in place. Uh, of course, that would be a silver bullet to put in, because that would mean an unrest in uh, in Russia. So that's that's number two. Then I would go to more uh, global scale, and of course, this conflict is not only between Russia and Ukraine. This is uh, Russia challenging the whole Western democratic liberal project. Uh, and, um, and that's already going on for some time. That's a continuous and consistent uh, project. And Russia is uh, putting all kinds of efforts into this and, and lots of resources, actually. All the all the media propaganda, uh, the RT project, which uh, which uh, which previously was called Russia Today, uh, all the activity of the, those troll factors, all the activity influencing uh, social media, uh, bribing European and and Western uh, politicians, usually far left or far right, both are good as far as they are far, you know, from the center. Uh, and uh, and all types, you know, not to mention the poisoning of uh, of those uh, uh, those uncomfortable to the to the system, and you know the the, the stories in the UK and, and and many other places. So uh, what Putin is doing is really challenging the whole project. He wants to show to his again to his inner audience that this is a failed project and the only feasible and, 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 and vital system is that which we created here, meaning uh, with the Tsar on top and all his elite taking control and people being obedient and enjoying what they what they get from the top. Uh, so I think that's the that's the point. And then to the next level, I think he has some um, some uh, I don't know how to call it. I, I I resist calling it spiritual ambitions, but but probably these are religious ambitions because uh, part of the uh, part of the uh, narrative that is being created is Moscow becoming the third Rome, as you know, the successor of Byzantine Empire and and the savior uh, of all those traditional Orthodox or even traditional Christian. Uh, values, which uh, which of course have been abandoned uh, in Europe, in the Western countries, which are filthy and rotten and so on. So uh, that's that's partly funny, partly surrealistic, you know, because the ex KGB officer is becoming a, a you know global spiritual leader in his uh, ill fantasies. Um, Unfortunately, that's the that's the reality we live in, and 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 it's really hard to say what what real ambitions are in the head of this this man. And fortunately, it's impossible to say. Yeah, if you read Dugin, Alexander Dugin, who has sort of yeah. been been framed as Putin's brain as a kind of real influence, he talks about this alternative system about. And it is a sort of almost religious perspective with Russia as reclaiming a sphere of influence, Russia as reclaiming a kind of spiritual or religious role in the world that I think you're right, like Putin has kind of really steered into that, um, whether he really believes it or whether it's just a good framework for creating an empire is kind of an interesting question. But there is, what comes up for me is thinking that, and you can almost say this about some of the 
Islamist thinking as well. So I remember reading Saeed Qubt, um, and a lot of the interesting thing is a lot of their critiques of the West have some value. Like a lot of the the Islamist critique of the West, like its decadence, its kind of lack of spiritual core. And I think something very similar could be said about Dugin. Like a lot of the critiques of the West that they kind of lost track of of a, a deeper kind of spiritual meaning of what we're doing, the kind of the destructive nature of capitalism where everything has a price and nothing has a value. There's some truth to their critiques, I would, I would argue. Um, and then it flips into, and the solution for the Islamists, the solution is the is the Umar and the imposition of Islamic law for everyone. And the same thing for, for, for the Russian perspective. It's like the, the, the solution is the kind of the, the rebirth of the Russian empire. So it's, it's interesting to kind of hold those two things in tension of like the critique can often be valuable, but the solution is usually wrong. So, yeah. I, and as someone who's sort of interested in integral, I guess, is sort of interested in spirituality. How do you hold that tension? Oh, that's a, that's a big question, and I I support the view that there's lots of um, uh, lots of uh, uh, contradiction which we need to accept. Uh, of course, uh, Dugin and thinkers like him, uh, they, uh, they find uh, they find good reason to critique uh, the Western uh, democracies, but. The, that's exactly where the developmental perspective kicks in because uh, we, uh, you know, you can you can be uh, very critical of something more mature, you know, of something coming from a uh, from the later stage perspective, which is more inclusive by definition, you know, and uh, uh, and then try to try to overweight to the, with the earlier stage uh, uh, values, like you mentioned, uh, Islamist approaches and, and the Russian. What, what Russia is trying to do is really bring up the lower uh, or early amber perspective, this very traditional orthodox uh, Christian values, which again, I think are dedicated only to the internal audience. Um, this, is, uh, this is the cynical way to make the Russian society obedient and convenient to the, uh, to the system. So what, how I think we should look at it from the Western perspective is just to distinguish these, uh, these uh, critique versus response. Uh, how to call it gap or tension you know because uh, we can we can discuss all measures as long as we are you know keeping the core western values you know, human rights and uh, freedom of speech and all those uh, those basic uh, human freedoms which are not there in Russia definitely yes yeah? so uh, again before really sympathizing, Let's look at what Russia is offering as uh, as an alternative. That's uh, that won't be attractive to anyone in the West. Yeah. So, is your perspective that we're in the West um, because green postmodern values are dominant, and postmodern is sort of that there is no one truth; there are multiple truths, and everyone's perspective is valid in some way. That, that's kind of the extreme version of green. Do you think that because that's the kind of dominant perspective, we are actually too um, open or too um, accepting of Putin's perspective or sort of not cynical or not, not skeptical enough of Putin's real motives and what Putin's really about? I think so. I think so. Partly because of that, because in this post-true world, and and by the way, I like Ken Wilber's book, uh, Trump and the the post-true truth world. Probably, is, if I remember the the name correctly, he 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 put it uh, brilliantly. And uh, and Russia is very good at manipulating this post-true world, basically bringing the same uh, the same 
arguments to their own people. What what you can hear in in, in public debate in Russia that yeah we are not we are not ideal we are not perfect we are we have corruption but look they also have corruption all of those uh, Western countries which try to teach us how to live you know and uh, the U.S. and the Western European countries everyone is is corrupt to some degree. So, but they they miss the to some degree part. They they just put it the black in in black and white uh, uh, terminology. And of course, when the uh, center of gravity of the society is at blue or amber, you know, then the black and white terminology works really well. You know, yeah, they are corrupt, we are corrupt. There's basically no difference. Uh, which is which is far far from from truth. So yeah, Russia is really abusing and overusing this whole post truth world and um, and the willingness of uh, the Western people to to really engage into that multi perspective discussion and really try to to hear them out to to hear their worries and concerns. Most of them are just purely manipulated, but still we need to hear, we need to sympathize, we need to get into their shoes. And, uh, and that's the ideal, uh, the ideal environment for the Russian propaganda and for this, uh, uh, this, the, 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 the you know, nurture of, of, of all those narratives uh, to really grow up and, and flourish. Yeah. So what do you um, hope will happen next or what do you think will happen next? Um, we still hope, I mean, we, uh, I hope and most of my friends hope that the real uh, traditional war uh, won't start in the nearest future. We still hope and I would be, of course, sad to, uh, to see it differently. Um, and um, and of course, I think we are entering into a new phase of the world, not only here around Ukraine, but generally in the Western world. I think the illusion of safety and stability, which we had during the last, I don't know, X years, no, maybe 10 to 20 to 30 years in different uh, different parts of, 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 of the Western world, it's really becoming an illusion and part of history. We, uh, we have to accept that we are entering a different uh, phase of uh, relative instability and relative uh, threat, more uh, fragile situation in many ways. Uh, and I think those um, attempts to keep that balance will require more efforts and more energy from all involved players. Uh, of course, given the China-US tension, which is uh, making the whole situation even worse or even more complex. Uh, so in a sense, we are speaking here in Ukraine that we are becoming the next Israel that we will be uh, uh, living in the, in, the, in, the, in the context of the constant threat and we need to learn to live it, in it and, and, and to be, uh, to stay functional in a sense, you know, not only to survive, but, um, but to work, live our uh, ways of life and uh, do our work and, and create our projects and, and uh, and bring our country to uh, to welfare and uh, you know, prosper. That's the that's the challenge. So I think that paradigm shift is an important one in the uh, in the nearest future. And of course, uh, of course, uh, there should be very coordinated action between uh, West and uh, Ukraine. Uh, which recently is uh, is showing very good signs of progress, uh, especially with the change of the mood and and tone in the U.S. Because just recently Joseph Biden was more uh, like he's he was not that decisive uh, speaking about the Ukrainian context and and even you know really mumbling about 
about what uh, what he would treat as an invasion, uh, to which extent, when the when the sanctions would kick off and so on. And I see that during the last days, literally, the whole tone is changing. And of course, we are very thankful for all kind of support. Uh, first of all, political support and, and, and moral support and support on the military side with the helping with the ammunition. And of course, God save the queen. Uh, we are very thankful to uh, to the UK for recent support. I think that coordinated action should uh, should continue. Um, uh, the Western countries should support Ukraine uh, in terms of you know uh, political, democratic, uh, diplomatic, and, and and all kinds of uh, soft powers uh, because this conflict is actually touching the broader. Uh, seen. It's not only about here, it's it's the challenge toward the Western countries. I uh, I think that's uh, that's pretty clear. Because mm. I think there is a lot of skepticism and concern about what, what people see as kind of warmongering in Washington, the sort of uh, foreign policy establishment there. And do you and I think people are much more worried about uh, sort of being the drumbeat of war kind of happening in Washington and in in London more than. Um, and do you think they're right to be scared about that? Um, that's a very difficult question. On the one hand, I would like to say, yes, there is some truth in this as well. At the same time, I think that no amount of appeasement would work. You cannot appease Putin. And, and sorry to bring that historic parallel, but it, it reminds me the, the the Munich conference of 1938 when Chamberlain and Delegier were trying to appease, uh, appease Hitler. And I think that uh, uh, that's very, those, those um, those possibilities are very limited. I think the Western uh, democracies should be firm. I don't mean uh, should be firm in the military sense. Of course, they should be firm in terms of uh, pushing against uh, Putin's uh, uh, Putin's aggression. Uh, but uh, uh, but of course, the the situation is fragile and um, uh, and. Um, uh, unfortunately, there is there is some threat of of this um, uh, open war, and if that starts, I am I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic about uh, about all those economic sanctions and um, and uh, di diplomacy and other uh, uh, other means of uh, of soft power. I think if again we are coming back to the developmental perspectives, what what the red respects is power, and uh, and I think the West should use as much power without coming into a military phase of power, of course, as possible in order to avoid uh, to avoid this. Uh, that's uh, yeah, that's uh, if we put it. Uh, um, Long story short. Yeah, I guess the question that people would have, and Barack Obama said something like this in 2014. He, he kind of said that the Ukraine wasn't a priority for America. The, the question is, why should we in the West be involved in any way? Uh, very briefly, because it will sooner or later, it will become your problem. To put it very, very bluntly, you know, uh, if the war in Ukraine starts, uh, so it will be felt in Europe very quickly. First of all, from the flow of refugees, and I think Syria can look like a uh, like a nice uh, rehearsal uh, compared to what you can expect from Ukraine, because this is a country of forty million people and. And of course, if people will need to flee the country, then you will see millions of refugees in Europe. That's that's the least uh, 
the least consequence, not to mention the economic consequences that if, if the West will, will, will need to impose all those sanctions, of course, there will be, there will be repercussions. And I think the really long chain reactions will start. And if Russia takes over Ukraine, uh, it will not stop there, definitely. Then they will require the Baltic states, uh, maybe again to move uh, NATO from Poland and, and others. I don't even want to go into that kind of discussion. But for me, it's pretty obvious that if the big time war starts here, then you will not be able to watch it on TV or on YouTube and just another as another football game. No chance for that, unfortunately. And yeah, so that's why I say that the Western countries should 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 use as much power as as firmly as possible in order to avoid military involvement. Vitas, thank you so much. And I hope you stay safe and I hope your family stays safe. And I hope that it doesn't um, take the turn that uh, that you're fearing. Thank you, David. Really, really appreciate what you're doing and really appreciate your support, especially moral, moral support to, to us here. Thank you. Thank you.